Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming to this informational forum put, about, put on by the White Bear Lake Area League of Women Voters. And it's called Minnesota Immigrants, the 2020 Census, and Fair Representation. My name is Liz Lauder, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters White Bear Lake Area. Uh, the League, um, as a nonpartisan organization, uh, we do not take a stand on candidates or political parties, but we do um, take, uh, take a stand on issues um, that relate to uh, fair representation, such as uh, an accurate and fully funded uh, census. And the League um, strongly supports an accurate and fully funded census because it determines um, voting districts and it determines uh, how many representatives each state sends to the U.S. House of Representatives. It also uh, um, uh, affects the amount of federal aid that is apportioned to uh, states and local communities for the next decade. Um, the U.S. Constitution uh, demands that we have a census every 10 years and the, uh, this includes um, that it should be a count of all persons living in each state. And this would include citizens and legal immigrants and non-citizens. Uh, however, uh, an attempt by the Trump administration to put a citizenship question on the 2020 census has been criticized uh, because it could discourage non-citizens from completing the census and thereby pro providing an inaccurate count of the number of persons in each state. And so uh, we wanted to know more about uh, the situation of immigrants living in Minnesota and um, how an undercount of the immigrants in Minnesota would affect us and them, of course, um, and then what steps we can take to ensure an accurate count of immigrants in Minnesota. And we're delighted tonight to have Maria Seha Orozco tonight to talk to us, and she is an attorney from the uh, Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota and also an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota School of Law Center for New Americans. And she's gonna be talking to us tonight uh, about the immigrant experience, and then she'll also um, take questions. I believe she'll take questions during her presentation too, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and um, I'll come by with a microphone for you so that we can record your question and she can respond. So, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that my name is a bit of a tongue twister, but just, it has two L's in Spanish. That sounds like a Y. So think of tortilla or quesadilla. Two L's sound like a Y. Um, so again, my name is Mireya Seja Rosco. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. And thank you, Liz, for the wonderful introduction. It's an honor to be here. Um, I, before I get started, I did want to give you just a little bit of background on me. So I um, am originally from California. I am um, a relocation to Minnesota. I came here for law school with the intent of only staying in Minnesota for law school. <laughs> Um, I had never really seen the snow before, um, <laughs> and I've definitely gotten my fill <laughs> of, of the snow, um, but I came here back in 2009 with the intent of coming for law school and then returning to California upon graduation. I had intended to come here specifically because I had never been to the Midwest before. I didn't know anyone from the Midwest, and I felt that as a Californian, though I appreciated where I came from and the diversity of coming from the Bay Area, um, that I needed to expand what it meant to be an American. Um, my father is originally from Mexico, but my mom is Swedish American. My family originates in Malmo, Sweden. Um, and so I've been able to track my family back through Ellis Island and the registry books on my mother's side. And obviously on my father's side, I'm able to track it back. Um, and the reason why I became an immigration attorney was because growing up, immigration was a very prevalent part of our life. My father was deported, um, and several of my other family members have gone through the immigration system and gone 
went through the process of obtaining a green card, but also the deportation system. So it was a part of my life growing up. Um, I spoke Spanish in the home. I did not learn English until about fifth grade, even though I went to school in California and I was born in California. Um, public education, when I was a child, you could choose the language of instruction. So I only took classes in Spanish. So I never really learned how to read or write English till about fifth grade. Um, <laughs> though my mother's side was Swedish American, um, crazy enough. And so um, it was part of my learning experience and having to become the translator for the family, one of the only people in my family that had legal status. Um, that I, it was my responsibility as a very young person to serve as the interpreter, um, to be the person at parent-teacher conferences for my cousins um, and my aunts and uncles to serve as that liaison or as that person. And as a as a ten year old, as a twelve year old, that's a very those are very big shoes to fill. Um, but they're shoes that I I now realize just how valuable they were to my experience, but also to the reason why I wanted to become an advocate for immigrants. Um, and being in Minnesota, I, I realized just the, the importance of having advocates in the community that were gonna serve people that understood some of that experience. I don't understand the whole experience, but I'm able to use what I've learned and my own experiences to help my, my fellow community members. So thank you so much again for having me here. So um, I am an attorney at the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, which is located in St. Paul. We're one of the nonprofits here in the state that tries to offer immigrant-based services to anyone that's in the state. Um, with immigration, it is regionally based, so it's not state based laws or cases, it's actually federal law. So you as a practitioner would be able to practice in any state in immigration law cases as long as you are licensed in a state in the United States. Um, so with our region, we represent cases that are in Minnesota as well as North and South Dakota, Northern Iowa, and Western Wisconsin. Those are all, of, that's our district. The immigration court is located at Fort Snelling, so right by the airport is the immigration, the federal building, and that's where the immigration court is located for both detained individuals as well as non-detained individuals. And the immigration office that processes applications for green cards, citizenship, any form of benefit is processed through, through the Minneapolis, the downtown Minneapolis office. And I believe it's the old Federal Reserve building that has like the U-shaped glass, that is now the immigration office where application benefits are being processed. Um, also, just so that you are aware, normally immigration, depending on the case that the individual have, uh, applications are sent to a federal office, usually in Vermont, Nebraska, or Missouri, and then will be transferred here after. Once they've decided that the case is here, they bring them here, but you have to send them to one of the national offices first. So just a little bit of backstory. So my job at the Immigrant Law Center is I'm one of the community defense attorneys, which means I'm a glorified public defender. In immigration, you are not granted a defense attorney if you are in proceedings unlike in a criminal case where you would be afforded a public defender. Immigration is a civil matter, it's administrative law. It's not a criminal case, so you are not given a defense attorney. So you are expected to either represent yourself or provide your own attorney. Um, but we are very fortunate in Minnesota that a lot of the community leaders, um, particularly county leaders, have designated funds to have attorneys available to at least provide information to individuals, if, if not full representation, to at least provide them information to as, uh, assess them or to help them understand what they're actually going to be doing if they are in proceedings, and then being able to represent themselves if necessary, providing them pro se information or materials that could help them. Um, so what we, what I do specifically is through specific funding that we've been granted, I'm able to represent certain individuals if they meet our income qualifications and are from particular counties because of those counties being the ones that have designated funds, I can become their defense attorney. Um, without discriminating um, what they're available uh, for or what they're eligible for, just the fact that they, I will be their attorney. Um, so it's it's kind of like a public defender-based system. It's a little bit you know more restrictive, but still we're able to provide representation for individuals. So please feel free to ask me any questions along the way. Yes, ma'am. What kind of caseload do you carry that can give us 
Um, so I used to be in private practice. So I used to work for a private firm. And when I was in private practice, I carried about 150 cases um, that varied in type. Um, I did some employment-based immigration cases, working with companies that had, they were bringing in doctors or researchers and needed visas for those employees. And then I also did family cases, which were like green card applications for your family that's abroad that you're trying to bring, as well as some removal cases, which are deportation cases. Um, so it was much more varied. Now that I do about 90% removal defense, I have about 50 cases. So it's a much lower number, um, but it's much more intense, particularly uh, right now. I, I promise I will try to be as nonpartisan as possible. Um, and, and if I offend anyone, I apologize. I, I do not mean to offend anyone. I, I respect everyone's views and opinions. Um, I can only speak on my own own experiences, so please do not be offended. But please let me know if, if there's anything that you feel is out of line. I appreciate that, and I welcome um, comments and feedback. So thank you. Um, but yes, I do. Yes, ma'am. Um, particularly in my case, because I do removal defense, um, some of the funding that we've been allocated is speci specifically for particular counties that have designated funds for defense spending um, of immigrants. And so some of the cases that we take are during, through this specific grant that we've been given or contract that we've been given through some organizations. Um, so it's our office, the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, as well as Advocates for Human Rights and the Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid that received a specific grant for a particular Hennepin County. Yes, ma'am. And that is one thing that um, other counties are starting to look into, how they can also get involved. Ramsey County has begun that process and looking at ways of allocating funds. And I believe they have des designated a particular group of funding um, and are in the process of figuring out how that funding will be used. Other counties like Olmstead County and Washington and Dakota County have looked into it but I'm not exactly sure where they are currently. But that's only one of our contracts. There are other cases that we have that are not through that specific grant, but unfortunately we're not able to guarantee people representation in those cases. Mostly it's giving them make a consultation and trying to help them figure out what to do. So part of what I do is I go visit the jails um, where there are immigration-based detainees and meet with anyone that is welcome, to co is welcome to come and meet with me if they would like to come and meet with me. I actually go into the jail pods, um, which is not the visiting area, but you're actually going fully into the jail and into the area where the cells are and there are tables there where we can meet and do co brief consultations with individuals that are currently detained. Um, so it's a little bit more intense. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Two quick questions. Yes. Not everyone that comes to you, uh, not every immigrant needs services. Is that correct? That is correct. Some of them, that is true. Um, certain detention centers, and that's one of the, the areas that we'll be covering, but some of them do not have um, grounds outside of the facility where they can go and play sports or work out or anything like that. So some of my clients, the only times they see the outside is when they're headed to the courthouse. I heard that there weren't windows. Uh, most of them do not have windows. That is correct. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. And um, it's not an immigration-based facility. Those are often county jails. So even criminal defendants that are being detained have that same experience. They don't have windows and don't have um, access to the outside. So 
Um, but I did have a PowerPoint, so I'm sorry if we ran out of copies, but I wanted to, in, in case people have questions along the way, like I said, please feel free to, to ask away. Um, but I did want to just kind of give some information about what Immigrant Law Center is. I'm going to call it ILCM for short. Um, but our office, uh, we have the, our statistics from 2017. Our 2018 statistics are currently being processed. But as of 2017, we had over 4,000 cases for immigrants in um, at our office. And um, had worked with individuals from about 115, 118 different countries, including Canada, the UK, um, parts of the EU that people never really thought needed representation, as well as Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind that not all immigrants that are undocumented or, or needing services are coming from south of the border. Um, we have people coming from all over the world that um, come to our office for services. Um, one of the other big projects that our office does is we provide consults for the state public defender's office. That's specific to our office. And that's under the uh, Supreme Court case that was called the Padilla case, which indicated that individuals that were going to be entering into any kind of a plea deal in a criminal matter, if it was determined that they were potentially going to be affected on the immigration side by taking that plea deal or agreement, that they needed to be advised of the possible consequences of doing that before taking a plea deal, because they needed to understand that maybe what they were going to be doing was going to be way more harmful to them than they anticipated or realized, and that maybe was worth going to trial for. So that's one thing that we offer, because we don't expect criminal defense attorneys to know the ins and outs of immigration law. So we have a contract with the state public defender's office where public defenders can call us and ask specific questions based on their case and what's happening, and we can kind of dissect it and determine what might be the best uh, uh, decisions for them to work with and trying to negotiate with the prosecutor's offices around the state. Um, so as of 2017, we had done uh, over 1,100 of those types of cases as well with the public defender's offices around the state. Um, so we do have about 35 staff in our office. So we have a 11 attorneys, but we have five different offices. So we have our St. Paul office. Then we also have one in, um, we have one in Moorhead, Worthington, Austin, and Winona. So that we are trying, you know, able to represent as many people as possible and get everyone access. You know, if they live in, in some more rural areas, we do ask them that they are still welcome to call. We are able to do consultations by phone. And because we are able to take cases from North and South Dakota, because they don't have access to legal services or access to opportunities, they can call us for information as well and we can try to find them representation or represent them through our office if, if they meet the qualifications for our office. Um, some of the other big things that our office does is we're a big part of the advocacy locally here in the state of Minnesota. One of the big pieces that we've been working on, not me particularly, but our office um, was actually, our office was at the Capitol building today, was for the Minnesota Driver's License Bill that they're trying trying to propose, and one of the reasons why we're really supportive of that is the notion that if people are able to get a driver's license, regardless of whether they have a social security number or not, our roads will be much safer because people will be identifiable, they'll have to take the test in order to be a driver on our roads, but also it will ensure that they get insurance, which helps us all. If we're in an accident, if we skid off the road and hit another car, we want to make sure that our drivers are insured so that people aren't left to fend for their own themselves with you know uninsured motorist insurance and things like that. So that's one of the big things that we're working on right now. Some of the other forms of advocacy that we are really helping out in the community or using in the community is helping organizations or communities or schools and different um, businesses determine what is a sensitive space. You may have heard that word or a sensitive location. And that means specifically what are areas in the community that should not be areas where ICE or Immigration and Customs Enforcement has free access to enter and obtain or detain someone. And it's helping people determine what is a safe space or what is not a safe space. That is separate from what is a sanctuary space or a sanctuary city, um, which is a very loaded word, especially in the media. But it, it's determining, you know, can someone just enter a hospital 
and detain someone if they know that they are undocumented or maybe need need to be restrained for immigration-based purposes. Um, determining our schools, places where ICE agents can just freely enter, um, and should schools take action, those types of things. So that's one of the forms that we uh, provide advocacy efforts depending on the organization and, and the questions that they might have in determining whether they should be declared a safe space or if they are protected by safe space laws. Another, yes ma'am. So normally, a safe space, when it's a safe space, it's, it's designated by the government through policy and memos that have been created by the Department of Homeland Security, um, not by the state. So usually it's places like schools where it's required that a warrant be made available in order to enter a school, Same, similar to how we're not going to let uh, someone who is unauthorized um, by the parents to just pick up a child without permission because they are a child. We're not going to just allow anyone on campus and take someone. Um, it's supposed to be. It is supposed to be. Um, Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Um, in some places, we have heard of communities that they themselves may call Immigration and Customs Enforcement to come pick someone up or giving away information. There have been reports of that even happening through the Public Defender's Office in other areas where attorneys themselves are calling ICE on their clients. Um, I haven't heard that here particularly, but that is something that has happened. Um, though it may not, it shouldn't be happening. Does that answer your question? Okay. One of the other big things that we've worked on is family preparedness plans. Um, and that basically is something that um, I had not really worried about doing until the 2016 elections, um, when there was a change in shift in policy and what was going to be considered a priority for detention and removal, um, where we wanted people to be safe and know that if they were detained for any reason, um, that they knew what was going to happen to their home, to their vehicle, to their children, who is going to have access to take their children to the doctor or take them to school or pick them up from school. Um, I, as a child, had that experience myself. Um, one, uh, um, when I was living in California as a kid, my, uh, parent, my, my mom called me, and I was in high school at the time, but she told me, Mireya, you, you need to go pick up Mari from school, and Mari's my little cousin, and I said, well, that's weird. Why didn't my tios, my aunt and uncle go pick up Mari? They always pick up Mari. And my mom said, we don't know where they are, so you need to go get them, or you need to go get her. And I didn't really understand what that meant, but I was like, okay, that's weird. So I went, and the school would not let me pick her up. They wouldn't let me pick her up because I wasn't an authorized person on her emergency contact, and neither was my mom. And it turned out that my aunt and uncle had been detained by ICE in a raid that had happened about two blocks away from the school. So my cousin's parents never, my aunt and uncle never made it to the school to pick her up. And it turned out finally, they turned me away, but my mom was able to go back later that afternoon and about 20 kids had been left at school. And it, by that time it had been about 6.30 p.m. And they had still been at school. And they, no one came to claim them or to pick them up that had authorization to pick them up. And that was my first experience was like, well, what, what do we do now? We, all these kids are here and the teachers didn't even know what to do. And so as, as a practitioner, after the 2016 election, that became a major uh, goal or objective or statewide is helping families prepare a plan that if anything were to happen to them, even if it's maybe not immigration related at all, if they're in a car accident and aren't able to get there, what will happen? Who will take care of my kids in the short term or in the long term if I need them, someone to go pick them up or that they need to spend the night at somebody's house for a couple nights while we figure something out? Um, you know, what kinds of medication will they need? 
what kind of, who will take them to school? Who will pick them up? If I can't get into my bank accounts because I'm currently detained, who will have access to my bank account? Who can sell my home or my vehicle if I need them sold? Who will have access to my refund check for the IRS? Those types of questions are being asked of parents. So that's one of the big things that we also provide is helping people create those plans of just emergency preparedness, just being ready in case of an emergency. And especially if you are undocumented or may in some way fear that you may face detention, just kind of having that in your back pocket is, is one sense of comfort that you know your kids will be safe or things will get taken care of if for whatever reason you're unable to do so yourself. Um, and another big one is know your rights. And I, we did provide some of the cards up at the front or in the back, um, which are little red cards. And those are know your rights cards. And those are cards that we offer to people to carry in their wallet that basically tells them, it's on English on one side and Spanish on the other, that tells people their rights. Regardless of your immigration status, you are guaranteed certain rights, like the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself. Regardless of your status, it's not designated specifically for citizens or permanent residents or anyone. It's for everybody. But oftentimes, we don't know that un unless we are educated enough to know we have rights, that we know English and can read the Constitution if we wanted to. Um, and those types of rules and rights that we have, we wanted to make sure that people had access to and could keep in a safe space spot so they can keep it in their wallet. Um, and what one of the things that it, it's become so valuable and important is that as priorities have shifted into who will be detained by immigration, um, oftentimes people may not know what those rights are in, in a moment's notice, but if they have it in their wallet, they can pull it out and at least give it to the officer, even if they don't speak the language, and in a way are affecting their rights or indicating these are my rights and I want to enforce them now. And even if they don't speak the language, because it's on English on one side and Spanish on the other, the ICE agents or Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents know exactly what that card is. Because it's red, they know that the red cards are the Know Your Rights cards. So if someone doesn't speak the language but knows that they have rights, they can hand that card over and it's essentially indicating that they want to make sure that their rights are protected. Um, so those are some of the different trainings that we offer for individuals, especially people that maybe have concerns because they don't have status and just want to know that they're going to be okay or that they, they do have a right to, to certain things before being deported. It's a, it's a myth um, that people often believe that if you're detained by immigration at any point, you will automatically be sent back to your home country. And that's not necessarily the case. If the person is detained and has never been detained by immigration before or has never been in any type of immigration-based proceedings, and they have the right to go before an immigration judge to defend their case because they may be eligible for a benefit that they never knew they were eligible for, or they may be eligible to defend themselves in showing that for the first time they are eligible for a new benefit because of the fact that they are currently in, in proceedings to be deported. So everyone has the right to at least defend themselves at least once from de deportation. So they won't automatically get put on a plane and sent back. However, if the individual has at some point in the past been deported or removed or gone through some form of expedited deportation if they were caught maybe at the border, depending on the circumstances, that person may no longer be eligible to fight their case before an immigration judge because they had their one chance and they didn't win. It, it depends on certain circumstances, in particular if the person has fear of returning to their home country, that they may be able to get another opportunity, but it's limited circumstances for that. So everybody's guaranteed at least one try to fight their case before being deported. Um, not everybody is entitled to, to a bond. Not everybody's entitled to fight their case without being detained. It depends on the circumstances. But so those are the types of things that we offer. Um, yes, ma'am. Ever Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of the impact on the population? 
Yes, ma'am. So the, um, for anyone that didn't hear the question, the question was whether how the government shutdown has impacted immigration-based cases, in particular in immigration court. And yes, um, the government shutdown severely impacted the immigration court system. Um, here in Minnesota, we have five immigration judges at the immigration court, three of whom do non-detained cases, so cases for people that are not in detention at this time, and two that handle detained cases for people that are being brought from one of the detention centers locally locally and to the, to the hearing. And um, for those that were in detained cases, people that are coming from the jails, those cases were moving forward even though the government shutdown was happening. However, they were happening with judges and prosecutors who are government agents who were not getting paid for the work. Um, so you can imagine what that was like. Um, I recall going to a hearing in early January and I, I stood up and I, before we started and I thanked the judge and the prosecutor and I said, I understand that this must be very hard for you because for the first time I'm getting paid and you're not. Um, and I can't even imagine what that's like. I don't have kids. I don't have a mortgage yet. Um, so I can't imagine what that would be like for someone to have to be forced to come to work knowing that they're not getting paid. And it's not easy work. Um, and I, I thank them both for being there and, and for working, but they, I knew for a fact those 35 days they were not getting paid. And it's not guaranteed that everybody that worked and didn't get paid will get back pay either. So, um, you know, I think it was very hard. But for the judges that are from the non-detained docket, they were not able to move cases forward. Um, and so I had one case that was scheduled for that Tuesday after the shutdown started. We still haven't been scheduled for a new hearing yet. So I don't know exactly when we'll be scheduled for the first hearing. Um, I had another hearing that was scheduled a couple weeks into the shutdown and we just got our first hearing notice for the next hearing and it's not gonna be until 2020. Um, so cases are definitely getting pushed back. I heard uh, yesterday that some cases for some individuals have already been pushed back to 2022. And they were cases that were supposed to have a hearing, just a hearing, not your final hearing, not a trial date, just a hearing, a preliminary hearing, pushed back to 2022. Um, and so, yes, ma'am. So, um, I don't quite understand. Um, sure. Anything yes, ma'am. That is correct. And they have been pushed back to 2021, 2022. Usually those types of cases when they're that long and far away are non-detained cases, so people that are not currently in jail. Um, the detained cases, because those are people that are using bed space, therefore are using tax dollars, it's very expensive. So those cases continue moving forward. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So Legally, as in um, for their case? So it depends on the circumstances of their case and it depends on the facts in their case. Certain cases, an individual that is waiting for a hearing is entitled to a work permit so that they can legally work, get a social security card and a driver's license, but not all cases. So unfortunately, if you don't qualify for a work permit, you are essentially just waiting to find out what to do but are not allowed to work or not authorized to work legally in the United States while you're waiting. And if you leave or abscond or leave the country, you've, since you've decided that you are going to abandon your case um, and, and will likely have a deportation order on your record that will prohibit you in the future if, if you try to seek a benefit later on. So and it's unfortunate, but yeah. Yeah, so it actually, that leads to my very next slide on my handout. So there's different forms of relief that someone is eligible for. So asylum and uh, refugee status, that, those, that is one particular form of relief. For refugees, those are individuals that have been designated by the United Nations abroad that they 
will suffer persecution or harm and uh, if they remain in their country. And so are brought to the United States or to another country that's going to offer them refuge. Um, so they are designated before they even come and have been screened before they come. Someone who is seeking asylum means that they were not designated in their home country or maybe did not face persecution yet, but now are going to face persecution if they go back. So can seek asylum status here. It's almost the same thing, except one is done here and the other has been done abroad and then are brought here. Um, but some of the other forms of relief that we see or, or benefits that people can apply for and things that we offer at our office, um, for people that are maybe going through immigration court proceedings, some of those benefits are asylum or ref, um, protection under the conventions against torture. So if we know that someone maybe is a um, some have been involved politically, and who will be targeted in their home country because of their political opinion might qualify for protections for under the International Treaty of Conventions Against Torture um, because we know that they will be tortured or have been tortured in the past or that country maybe has a history of violence and torturing uh, of people with that political background or experience or um, involvement. And so we're able to provide that kind of protection and our office does handle those cases. I have a few of those cases myself. Um, some of the other types of cases that we will work on are bonds, people that want to seek bond and need to apply for a bond. So we need to provide evidence to show that they qualify for a bond. So we do those as well. Um, and some of the other cases that we're going to start working on that our office for the first time will have are habeas petitions. Our habeas petition is a petition for someone who has been detained for an excessive period of time, and because their case is still pending, it, we consider it unfair that they are still detained and should be able to wait outside um, because of the length of their case. And so our office is currently working on developing that program because we're going to have an attorney starting in a few months that's going to be specializing in those types of petitions. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Some of the other areas of practice within our office that are not necessarily immigration court cases, but are forms of relief or benefits that people can apply for that our office handles are citizenship cases or naturalization cases. When people are eligible to become a citizen in the United States, our office handles those types of cases, um, as well as some humanitarian cases. Now, you may have heard of some of these. Uh, one is the VAWA type of petition, Violence Against Women Act petition. Um, is a specific petition for victims of crime where the uh, persecutor, the person causing the harm, perpetrator, is a US citizen or permanent resident. We often see cases where someone may be using their status as a citizen or permanent resident as a form of domestic violence, as a form of enforcing control um, in a relationship. And so that's a specific type of humanitarian-based case that we can file. We also do U visa petitions and T visa petitions. Petitions. U visa petitions are for victims of crime where they have made the report to law enforcement. Um, it has to qualify under certain guidelines, but where we are able to prove that they've cooperated with law enforcement in um, seeking justice on that and that crime, whether that be an assault, domestic violence, um, torture, you know, things like blackmail, stalking, those types of things. And T visas are designated for trafficking victims, um, particularly after uh, when the Super Bowl was here in Minnesota, we saw a spike in trafficking. Um, you often see a spike in trafficking cases wherever the Super Bowl is being held or large sporting events. Um, we've also seen a large number of trafficking cases in rural Minnesota, particularly um, in some of the agricultural um, industry locations where we're seeing people being trafficked to, to work at uh, processing, meat processing plants or dairy farms and things like that, where we see that there's that need and so people are being um, tricked maybe into working um, or forced to work. Um, and, and so we're handling those cases within our office as well. Um, some of the other types of cases that you may have heard of are the, the DREAMers, the DACA cases. And those are for young people that were maybe brought to the United States um, by their parents or by someone other than themselves deciding it. They were brought as children and are now living in the United States and 
all but a piece of paper deciding that they are citizens, but they don't actually have status. And so the Obama administration had designated a temporary status program for them called the um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, which said that every two years, as long as this individual could prove that they had been here for a certain number of years before they were considered an adult or if they had been brought before they turned 16, and had lived here for at least five years, that they could get a work permit so that they could essentially just live the life of a daily um, teenager, American, but not necessarily be designated a status of citizenship or permanent residency. So it would only give them a work permit, but it would allow them to live in the United States. Um, and that program obviously became very successful. There were over 800,000 people that applied for the DACA program. In Minnesota, we had about 7,000 um, that are considered DACA recipients. And so they are given a work permit, and with the work permit are essentially then able to apply for a social security number and and a driver's license. Um, I have a few DACA family members in my family, and it was a very exciting experience for them because it, um, one of my cousins was in high school when he got DACA, and he was a senior, and for the first time, he was gonna be able to do driver's ed because now he was gonna be able to get a driver's license. And my other uh, cousins who were a little bit older did not do driver's ed in high school because they knew that they were never gonna be able to get a license. So they were like, why bother? Um, so that was, for, for at least for our family, a big milestone, uh, which most people don't think about. If, if you are entitled to a license and you, you don't even think, oh, why, you know, driver's ed is not that big of a deal, but for, for a teenager, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and so the ability to get to do that, to get to apply to college, um, not so much that where you apply or where are you gonna go, but just the fact that you could do it um, was a big step for people. And so, yes, sir. So as of right now, it is pending. Um, the Trump administration had indicated that they wanted to end the program, essentially um, had indicated that in September of 2017 that the program was gonna be ended, so it was going to expire as of March 2018. Um, however, there were multiple states and jurisdictions that filed lawsuits indicating that of the harm that that would actually cause to those communities and to those economies if that happened because now you had 800,000 taxpayers and if you all of a sudden take out 800,000 taxpayers, that's really gonna harm a lot of economies. And so um, it was stopped or there was a, an injunction placed on it. So as of right now, there are, they are not allowing new applicants to apply. Though they may qualify and have met all the requirements, new applicants cannot apply. But people that have it now are still able to renew it because it's a two-year program. So every two years, you're expected to renew it. Um, and until further notice, they are only accepting renewal applications for it. Um, and with the DACA program, the, every time you apply for a work for the renewal, it's 495 dollars. So it's a self-sustaining program where the, the immigration-based employees that are handling DACA cases, the filing fees themselves pay the salaries of those working on those cases. Yes, sir. Yes, so it's it's an executive order. So it was an executive order created by the Obama administration, and it's similar to other um, temporary status programs where it's designated by um, the executive order not into law. The DREAM Act was uh, introduced by the Senate, but it never passed. And so that's where the DACA program came from. It was a temporary fix to the bigger issue at hand because the, the DREAM Act had not passed. Um, and so, it and the DREAM Act, I believe, has now been reintroduced about five or six times um, throughout the last 15 years and it's never passed. So that's why there was that temporary fix, but it still hasn't been handled. So the DREAM Act was was going to be a statute or a law that was gonna be created that indicated that certain individuals that could prove that they had good moral character had been here since 
childhood could apply to become a permanent resident because they had met certain goals and they did not have status. And it was designated for young people that were maybe brought by their parents or somehow had entered the country by a certain time um, and could not do very much or, or contribute to society in certain ways because they did not have a social security number or a driver's license, but appeared to be American, um, spoke English, oftentimes were educated in our public school system. And so th there was that need of, of giving them some sort of status in order to make sure that they were gonna contribute to society. And um, that's kind of where it, I think, resonated. And it's, it's varied over the years how the laws or the bill has been written, but it's still never passed, which is why they, um, the Obama administration passed this executive order to just give a temporary fix that would be renewable and constantly checking those individuals' st um, criminal backgrounds and making sure that they were complying and maintaining status because you can lose DACA. Um, because it's renewable every two years, when you reapply, you have to resubmit fingerprints and those fingerprints get sent to the FBI. Um, you know, If an individual um, committed a crime while they had that status, they could get taken away get it taken away, and then also placed in removal or deportation proceedings. Does that make sense? OK. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think it, it depends on the individual. Oftentimes, um, for some people, especially now if they have a work permit, they're able to get a job and are able to pay that renewal fee. Um, but not everybody can, especially young people. If you're thinking about a 15 or 16 year old, that's a lot of money. Um, and so, and you are not eligible for a fee waiver. There's no scholarships available for that. So individuals did have to come up with the money individually. Um, we actually, our office was, um, did a fundraiser and we gathered about, almost, I think almost $35,000 to help pay filing fees for, for kids that were going to be applying for DACA renewals. Um, I've heard of people, at least when I was in private practice, that their church or their school or somebody was doing fundraisers to get the kids some of that money. Um, because it's also important to note that a renewal and a replacement of DACA still costs $495. So if you were working with a 17-year-old who lost their wallet and their work permit happened to be in there, they would have to pay $495 just to get a new card. So they, it's not the same as a license. It's maybe an $8 replacement fee or $20. They had to pay the $495 again um, to get a new card. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> So the fee to become a citizen, I believe it's still $680 to become to apply for a citizenship application. Um, that's an N-400 application, and it takes about a year to process a citizenship application because they do extensive background checks. Um, they do um, Interpol, they do the FBI, CIA. There's a bunch of international checks that are done on an individual. You have to provide proof that you've done paid your income taxes, um, and essentially have complied with numerous rules before you're able to actually even obtain citizenship status because citizenship is the greatest thing you can get in immigration's eyes. So it's going to be the most protected, um, which is also very important for people to know is that if you as an immigrant or non-citizen ever claim to be a US citizen when you are in fact not, you are forever barring yourself from ever becoming a citizen. You will never be able to become a citizen if you have declared that you are a citizen at some point. And so for people that may be working with false documents, if they are working with those of an actual person who is a citizen or have indicated on their I-9 that they are a citizen, they are forever barred from ever applying for immigration benefits which is very painful when they realize that they will never be able to apply. There's no waiver for that because citizenship is protected so heavily. Um, so for some people that that's life threatening or damaging because they will never be able to get a green card or become a citizen. Was there another question? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, 
Yes, sir. Me personally? You're considered undocumented. Um, you're not supposed to be considered illegal because you're requesting admission at the border based on asylum. And oftentimes you are what's called paroled in. So you're given permission saying, yes, we understand you're seeking asylum. Here's, we're giving you an ID number, also known as an alien number, an A number and you will be scheduled for a hearing or interview or something along those lines. There is a misunderstanding of what that means now, especially in the media where they don't use the proper terminology um, and are saying th these are illegals. But a lot of those people that are entering at the port of entry seeking asylum should not be determined illegal because they were granted permission to enter pending a decision on their particular case. But oftentimes are still called illegals. One other thing I would hear is uh, people should wait in line. Can you uh, enlighten us on a little bit of the line or not? In, um, well, there's multiple lines. So there's the physical line of being at the port of entry. And if you've ever crossed a port of entry, um, it's particularly on the southern border, um, it's a very, very long line. Um, I've crossed through Tijuana coming, being from California, I've crossed the border in Tijuana a few times, um, or Minnesota's called Tijuana. Um, and the wait time was about three and a half hours for me to cross in a, in a vehicle. Um, and then there's also the pedestrian line, which also takes a significant amount of time. Um, there's also the line for people that are seeking asylum at the border that are coming up to the port of entry doors and requesting asylum. So they're in a separate line than what a citizen or permanent resident would be in because we have documents to show, well, we have a right to be in this country. So we go through another line where they have to actually get processed, um, where they have their fingerprints taken, they get questioned. There's a whole questionnaire that must be completed in order to determine that they're not lying um, and to verify their identity that they're not lying about who they are and actually have come in multiple times as someone else or using false documents and things like that because you are expected to have some form of identify, identification of yourself and your country of origin. Um, and so there's that line. Um, there's also the, like just the figurative line of, you know, the wait times and processing times and those are quite extensive too. I, I had an asylum case that was filed in 20. 14, and it's still pending now. So, sure. Um, well, for particular for Guatemala, that doesn't exist um, because we don't have, as far as I know, United Nations has not designated Guatemala as a crisis area where um, people can apply to become a refugee. So we don't have a... Uh, like a UN office, they're designating people, at least as far as I know, designating people to apply as a refugee, where we do have it, not in Somalia, but in Kenya, where Somalis can come to Kenya, live in the, the camps that they have, the refugee camps in different parts of Kenya or in Ethiopia, and then apply to become a refugee and wait at those camps until their number is called and, and they are determined whether they're eligible to be a refugee or not. And as of right now, I believe that, um, at least for Somalia, because we still have the travel ban in place, those numbers are very, very small and the wait times are years and years of waiting. The other line that exists or, or processing time that exists is for family-based petitions just in general. The average wait time right now, for example, for a Mexican, to who is a citizen of the United States. Um, they may be naturalized or by birth a citizen, but they have family members in Mexico. Um, let's say, we'll say your sister lives in Mexico um, and you wanna bring her because you are here and you want her to live here with you. Um, the average wait time is about 22 years for you to bring your Mexican sibling to the United States. So for me, I have sisters in Mexico and I filed petitions for them last year. And our wait time, they will be in their 50s, 60s 
when it can come legally to the United States. So, um, and the reason being is that each country has designated a certain number of visas that we will allow for that particular country to enter the United States for a green card or family-based petition. However, those numbers were designated many years ago when the trends for where the vast majority of our immigrants were coming from were very different. Um, so Mexico, at least in the 50s and 60s, we didn't see as many coming as we do now. Um, but if I wanted to bring my sister she'd have to wait about 22 years. So it's a, it's a very you know, long, long wait time. The Philippines um, and China and India also have designated wait times um, because those are the four countries with the long, largest groups of people trying to enter the United States for family-based petitions. They have their own designated wait lists, whereas other, uh, every other country, the wait time for a sibling is usually about 14 years or 15 years. So it's definitely a long line in that sense. Does that make sense, it's kind of? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, we can talk more about it later, too. Um, okay. <laughs> it doesn't make, that's why we want immigration reform. <laughs> we want the numbers to reflect those people that are coming now and the trends, because the trends change. You know, we had a time where the vast majority of our immigrants were coming through Ellis Island and were, you know, German or were Irish or were Italian. Then we had a trend where the, a lot of them were coming from Asia. They were Chinese, they were Japanese, they were Vietnamese. Then we had a trend where it was growing numbers of Latinos based on they were coming from Mexico. Then we saw a growing number from, from you know, the Middle East. And now we're starting to see trends of Central and South America numbers really shooting up. Whereas other countries may have either gone down or stayed the same. And our immigration laws don't reflect those waves. And that's where some of the problem, I think, lies, is we don't, we're not following the waves and trends of the people. Um, and, and so those numbers continue to grow and the wait times continue to rise because there continue to be applications every single day, but less and less people are getting those because of the wait time that they're having to, to wait for the processing. Um, so back to, I guess, kind of sort of our slides. <laughs> um, so in Minnesota, we have four primary detention centers where people that are in immigration proceedings are, are held. Um, the largest at Sherburne County Jail, which is in Elk River, so it's about 50 minutes or so from here. Um, that is where the vast majority of people that are initiating proce proceedings will be detained if they're caught here in Minnesota. Um, so I go there every weekend um, and work with different people that are currently detained there, particularly um, if I have clients, I meet with them. It's easier for an immigration attorney to go on the weekends than during the week, because during the week, um, priority is often, um, not officially, but often given to criminal defense. Um, and it's just because there's just so many any. Um, yes, ma'am. The federal government, so the Department of Homeland Security, um, I, so the, that's a good question. So the Department of Homeland Security handles ICE, which is Immigration Customs Enforcement, Enforcement and Removal Operations, which is ERO. So those are the agents that are often coming to people's homes and detaining them, and also uh, handles TSA and Border Patrol. So that's through the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Justice handles the immigration courts, and the, immigra uh, the Department of State handles all cases for people that are abroad, and the embassies and things handling being handled outside of the US to bring people to the US. Um, but so for the jails, ICE, uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, Enforcement does contracts with particular facilities in order to rent beds. Um, and because in Minnesota we do not have ICE designated facilities or uh, jails specifically for immigration purposes, we just rent beds out of other county jails and use their bed space. So the primary ones that we use or that are used in immigration are Sherburne County Jail, Carver County Jail, um, Freeborn County Jail, and Candy Ohio County Jail. So Freeborn is in uh, Albert Lee, and uh, then we have Carver, which is Shaska, and then we have Candy Ohio, which is Wilmer, 
Minnesota. So those are the primary facilities where ICE in Minnesota rents bed space to detain individuals in immigration proceedings, both men and women. I think it, there is some strategy to why they pick certain places. Um, I don't know the exact reason why those were the designated ones. I think Sherburne in particular is one of the larger county facilities um, who also has contracts with the U.S. Marshal's Office. So there are federal detention, like criminals, in those facilities, um, as well as county-based criminal uh, defendants that are being detained for numerous reasons, um, and then the ICE deten detention facility people. Well, actually, they make money people, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, there are also private, privatizing is a big thing, and privatizing jails is a, a big industry, um, and especially I've d represented cases out of Louisiana and Georgia, and all the facilities that I've gone to in those states are private uh, jails, and so they're making money, it's a where they have a board of trustees and things like that, and so it's, it's, it's incentive in a way to those organizations maybe to detain people, yeah. Is yes, ma'am. Um, yes, <laughs> um, I think for the purposes, I think for of, of immigration-based cases, um, I think it's hard to say because it depends on the facility individually. Um, I think at least when they're in the county facilities, you have someone to hold accountable um, in a very different way because it's the county. You know, you're, you, you, there's access where if it's a private company, there's very little that they have to give as far as information or services at the facility um, and access. It's, it's very different when it's a private company and it's a county. Um, so in, in that sense, we may be fortunate that we are, the contracts are with county uh, jails, so there are certain rules that apply to immigration-based detainees that will apply to any criminal um, or detainee at that facility. Um, because again, most immigration detainees, are it's a civil matter, it's not a criminal-based matter, but they are detained in facilities where there are criminal defendants or detainees being held there too. Um, so that's that can be a little intimidating, but um, we also, as I mentioned, we have, because Minnesota represents uh, the region where North and South Dakota also have immigration proceedings, we work with Grand Forks County Jail and Minnehaha County, so Grand Forks is in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and then Minnehaha County is uh, where Sioux Falls is in South Dakota. So we'll often see cases coming out of those areas to, to the immigration courts here. Yes, ma'am. Do you know if, um, with the separation of families at the southern border, do you know if there has been any detention centers for children here in Minnesota? That there are designated detention centers for children here, no. I do have some of those cases, though. Um, they've started sending children up here. In one of my particular cases, we actually have court on Monday. Um, the mother was here, and we couldn't find the child. Uh, and the child was too young to know his mother's name. Um, but luckily we found the child. Um, it took about six months, but we were able to find the child in New York, and the child had been placed in the foster system in New York. Um, and it was a, it was awesome in, in the sense that we were able to find the child. It was very, very difficult to watch um, the child not recognize his mother because he was had been separated from her for so long, and he was young enough to where it was he didn't fully remember what she looked like anymore. And to her, or to him, it was mommy. It wasn't Mary or, you know, whatever the name may be. It, it, it was really hard, I think, to, to deal with, like, watching that happen. Um, but we are starting to see that happen uh, where we are being able to reunify families and have them defend themselves together. Yeah, they're not not necessarily detained here. We have very, I don't think we have any children detained here. Oftentimes, if they are placed into removal proceedings, they're released shortly after their detention. Um, uh, we'll often see it like if they're, the whole family is detained together, well, they'll be processed and then released. Um, I, I don't know that we have any kids currently being detained in facilities. I think that there is some, 
some um, state involvement in the contracts. There was discussion of ICE having an immigration-based facility here in Minnesota somewhere they hadn't designated where, um, and there was pushback on it, and so they ended up canceling the idea. Um, so that could happen in the future if the state wanted to open up a private facility or a county wanted to offer bed space for immigration only or for children included or families that are being detained. Um, but the larger facilities are currently on the southern border and some of the um, bigger states on the coasts. We'll see those. Yes. So those private, and as you said, it's like private prisons, there's a great mode of, of you know, profit motive there. Yes. So oh, yes. It's, it's a profit. It's a very profitable industry. And that's one big difference between like the county. Oh, yes. Very much. There's an incentive to detention and they didn't in those. Back prison yes, in Minnesota. Yep, exactly. Because I believe that the ICE specific facility that they were looking to build um, was going to be private. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we, there was pushback by the state in that case. Yeah. Um, so some of the things that we've already kind of talked about, but we talked about the government shutdown and the backlogs that it's caused. Also, it, it caused a lot of number, a large number of issues with Border Patrol and TSA. Um, both, obviously, if, if you were watching the news or had traveled at all, there were very few workers getting paid those days. So you might have had a very easy time um, getting through the airport. I went. I had to travel quite a bit during the government shutdown, and um, I was never asked to take off my shoes. I was never asked to pull my laptop out of my bag, which normally I do. Now I have um, Global Entry, which is a TSA pre-check thing, so I don't have to go through that process. But I was never asked to pull anything out and I had actually traveled abroad and on the way back no one on our flight of 250 plus people was asked any questions by Border Patrol. We all just walked through and I couldn't believe it and I was coming through Houston. Um, so I expected us to be waiting a long time thinking that each one of us was going to get checked by the one or two agents working when, in fact, none of the 250 people on my flight were asked any questions. Um, so we saw that there was obviously people not, not that they didn't care, but they weren't getting paid. So there was no incentive for them to perform the functions of their job. There was also a report in the news about a gentleman, I think he left out of Atlanta airport and made it all the way to Tokyo with a gun in his bag, in his um, carry-on, and no one noticed. And it was very likely because the agents here local, or the agents at the airport in the United States hadn't processed it. But when he got up to Tokyo, they checked his bag and they were like, "What? how did this gun get here? Um, so there are definitely security-based concerns, which that is a big concern now, which is why there are claims that the wall is so necessary, yet the government shutdown still happened. But that is, I, that is my personal opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I digress. Yes, ma'am. Yes and no. According to reports, USCIS, which is the immigration-based office that handles applications for benefits, were supposedly not impacted by the government shutdown because the fees that they create through the application process um, were supposed to be used to pay the employees. However, in practice, we know that that's not necessarily the case. If, for example, you had someone who needed to get a background check by the FBI, but the agents handling the FBI background checks were impacted by the government shutdown and weren't able to work. So now this person's case, though the immigration office can handle it, the next step in the process could not be handled because their office was sh the shutdown for the purposes of doing the background check. So it in, in, indirectly affected cases, and we know that that's the case. We also know that with the shift in priorities generally, um, with the focus being on deportation and removal, that a lot of effort has been put into getting people out 
and taking longer time and processing and, and focusing more money on that side than actually processing applications. So it, both of those things. But yes, the government shutdown indirectly has impacted a large number of cases because maybe processing was slower, there were less people on hand. Um, the holidays always tend to be a slower time um, just because people are going on vacation, time, people are taking time off, things like that. Um, and also more people are spending money on other things than immigration thing, you know, pen applications. But we saw that there was a drastic change during that shutdown, though technically it wasn't immigration that was shut down for that particular type of case. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So one of the other big things, and I know we, we talked about we we're going to get to the census, but we can I can I promise we'll get to the census. But one of the just the quick things that I wanted to make sure that we mentioned was the travel ban. So the travel ban is still in effect. Um, a lot of it's no longer in the media, so a lot of people have forgotten that it exists. But it is still in effect for particular countries um, that um, prevent people from coming into the, the United States if they are from one of the seven countries listed: Somalia, Yemen, Libya. Venezuela, North Korea, uh, Chad, no, is Chad, maybe Chad, I, now I don't even remember. But yes, yes, <laughs> I think, yes, I think you're correct. Um, but those countries are still being impacted by the, the travel ban. Um, so essentially, if you have a family member or petition from, from someone that's from one of those countries, they will still be impacted and potentially unable to come to the United States. So I have multiple Somali-based clients who um, have approved applications to come, but because of the travel ban, they are essentially in limbo waiting, um, and we'll be waiting until further. Yes, ma'am. And what are our largest immigration populations here in Minnesota? In Minnesota, our largest communities are definitely Mexican, um, uh, Somali, Hmong, and we have a really large uh, Ecuadorian and now Central American base. Um, Ma'am? A Liber yes, a very large Liberian community as well. Our largest for sure is Mexico. Uh, we have a Mexican consulate here in Minnesota because of how large it is. It's actually located in St. Paul. Um, and then we have a very large Hmong and Somali community because Minnesota was designated as the point of refuge for a lot of those refugees coming into the United States. And I believe Minnesota has the largest Somali population in the whole country. Outside of Somalia, yeah, I think I think Kenya might have the United States beat, but yeah, it's one of the. Which, like you say, is now affected by the travel. Yes, ma'am. Unfortunately, a lot of our clients that are of Somali um, heritage or culture are impacted by that um, travel ban. Um, the other thing that's really, really important to keep in mind, it, it is the crisis at the southern border. We are starting to, you know, see that people are, you know, when they do apply for asylum, um, they are being detained in facilities at the border and then often transferred to other facilities to make bed space at the border. So we're starting to see at the detention centers here locally a large number of people that tried to enter legally into the United States seeking asylum but have actually never been outside of a detention center because at the time that they entered were apprehended or they turned themselves in essentially and are now waiting to process their application all while detained. So we have a large number of, actually, of Cuban uh, individuals who have been seeking asylum in different parts along the border. And when I talked to a couple of them, they said, you know, I, I don't know what I did wrong, and I feel like a criminal when I just, I tried to enter legally, and I didn't realize that I was gonna be detained for six months. Um, several have been detained since about August, September, and remain in detention, and were transferred from the facility in Texas to Louisiana, and then from Louisiana up to Minnesota, and are now currently pending cases in, in um, at Sherburne County Jail for, Cuba touches a beach in Florida, they automatically were allowed to stay. Yeah, that, that doesn't apply anymore. Yeah. So we, we I think, have, I, I, I want to say there's 15, a group of about 15 Cubans that are currently detained at Sherburne County Jail that are people that all tried to enter legally. They weren't caught at the border trying to cross illegally or using false documents. They they went to the port of entry and said, I am Cuban and I'm seeking asylum. Mm -hmm. So, 
All right. Now, let's talk about the 2020 census. If there are any other questions or if anybody has any other questions, please feel free. I know this is somewhat d difficult and it's not the, the you know, nicest conversation to have, but I'm honestly, I welcome any questions or, or things that you have. Yes, please, I want it. So there's discussion that people may be able to get their citizenship revoked um, or because they are naturalized, they are not born citizens, that they could get that taken away or that that would be called into question when that should not be the case. However, there are cases, which is legal, where if you committed fraud because you did commit a crime at the time that you were applying for citizenship and you did not disclose it and an officer did not catch it at the time, but you should not have gotten your citizenship because of that crime, your citizenship can be revoked. I haven't heard that particularly happening in Minnesota. Um, it, it definitely raises eyebrows and definitely raises concerns if, if you it determined later that you had maybe committed fraud or did not disclose something where it can be called into question. But usually, um, in order to make you ineligible for citizenship, it has to be a certain level crime. So a minor traffic violation should not be enough to prohibit you from being able to naturalize. Um, but it can raise concerns, or if it's something that's enough to where maybe you should have needed to wait a few more years before you had eligibility to prove that you were of good moral character, then those can be called into question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That is correct. That is correct. That is that is correct. That is what's supposed to happen. I know that there have been concerns of individuals who are naturalized but may not look a certain way and are detained by immigration um, and now are suing the government because they were citizens and shouldn't have been taken into custody, but because the officers didn't believe them or they didn't look American enough, may have been detained. And I, I think that was what the person indicated um, was that they believed that because they didn't look American enough, that's why they were taken into custody. Um, but yes, essentially, you would be treated maybe for the criminal act, but after that, you shouldn't be touched, like any of us, where, where if we've committed an act that requires that we be in a federal penitentiary for a certain number of years, okay, so be it. But then upon exiting that facility, we would continue to be able to reside in the United States. Granted, we might have you know, other issues to deal with, <laughs> but... But yes, you're still a, you're still a citizen. That is correct, as long as you did not commit fraud at the time of. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I think that's. Ah. I know that there's been cases of people getting detained because they were verifying their claim that they were in fact a citizen, but then told they had to be released. I know that there was a case of someone who actually had been deported and had to be brought back because they were a US citizen, and I know they filed a lawsuit against the federal government um, for discrimination and things like that. So, um, But I haven't heard that, that that's actually happened yet, where it's that they're actually taking them away um, if they can prove that they are in fact citizens. They're supposed to be released immediately upon an officer determining that they are a citizen. That's also, it also raises an interesting concern because that is why um, post 9-11 uh, carrying identification has become so important is that you need to be identifiable at all times for the purposes of national security. Um, and if you are not identifiable, an agent or an officer has the right to detain, detain you until they can prove who you are and that you are who you say you are. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see people that don't aren't carrying any form of identification and so they'll be detained until it can be proven that they are who they say they are. And that, that became a bigger issue post 9-11. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You're saying that we're all supposed to be carrying Yes, ma'am, everybody is supposed to be carrying identification. 
yes. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's a matter of national security that we are supposed to be detained, however, or that we are supposed to be able to identify ourselves. However, there have been um, examples where if you look a certain way, you won't get asked that many questions. Um, if you have an accent, you might get asked more questions. If you look a certain way, you might get asked more questions, and, and that lead to something else. Not necessarily, but it can. Yes. <laughs> All right. If the, and again, if there are any other questions, please feel free to ask. But so getting to the 2020 census, one of the biggest things of why this has become such a big deal is because of how it's going to impact the state of Minnesota. Minnesota stands to lose a congressional representative, in particular, I believe, in northern Minnesota, because the number of Minnesotans in, a number of people in Minnesota, the population is actually decreasing. Um, the population is getting older, um, and also less and less people are living in rural communities and, and are starting to come to the urban areas. And so we're seeing that the, it's, it's becoming that we are desperate to ensure that numbers in certain p places are being accounted for accurately because of what in the census provides. And as uh, there's a report that I made um, available that in 2016 alone, we had over $15 billion allocated to Minnesota. Um, and that goes to funding schools, that goes to funding and paving roads, all those nice potholes that we have on the freeway right now, all of that is paid for in part with, with federal funds. And if the census tally is not done correctly, um, we stand to lose a large number of, of funds. And in particular, it's there was a report recently done by the University of Minnesota which determined that the because the population is getting older, it is becoming more dependent on young people, and it's becoming exceedingly more dependent on immigrants. And if immigrants are not accounted for, what Minnesota stands to lose as a manner of, um, I guess, in a way, defending itself um, and protecting itself financially against other states is also going to be devastating to the to the local economy. We've already started to see the economies of smaller towns be impacted by um, immigration-based issues, particularly towns where large raids have been conducted. Um, you see an instant drop in uh, population size, as well as the number of like small businesses having to shut down um, following a big raid that happened in Wilmer. Almost half the population left the town. And so you, you saw a drastic shift in, in the local economy being impacted by that. Um, you also see that um, if, if you don't have the children in schools, schools aren't going to get the funding for the every day that they are there, they get a certain number of funds. I'm sorry, I'm not saying, saying it the most eloquent way. Um, but you know those things are daily things that impact our economy, and so the um, in order for Minnesota to continue to be a profitable and a growing economy, it's going to become more and more dependent on immigrants. We are also seeing in, in a lot of the agricultural fields, um, farmers that are not getting the workers that they need, the number of workers that they need, that their crops are going to waste. Cornfield, soybean, uh, we're seeing it with green bean farmers, dairy farmers and dairy producers, milk processing, or meat processing plants are being impacted um, because of the lack of of employees coming to work for them. And even if it's illegal or legal, we're, we're seeing that the number of people eligible for visas for employment-based purposes is also drastically reduced. And so a large number of, of farmers are being uh, impacted in that way. And it's it's necessary for Minnesota to sustain itself that, that immigrants become a big, bigger part of the, the community. Um, and one of the biggest qu concerns of the 2020 census is that this question of citizenship and whether that question should be added to the census. The question of citizenship has not been asked since the 1950 census. And it was taken off because of the chilling effect that it has. Because if you are going to be asked your citizenship status, that drastically changes the way someone might view the whole process and their trust in the process. Is that going to get me in trouble? 
do I need to prove it? What if they come to my house? You know, do I need to be worried? Are, is ICE going to come? And especially right now, when we're dealing with a a um, a, a very a time where determining your status and whether you deserve to stay in the United States has become so prevalent, um, it, it, it's going to have a very uh, drastic chilling effect on those that partake in the census, when in fact, we need to know who's here because we want to ensure that we have enough money to make sure that our freeways are secure, that we have the people coming to shovel um, or plow that are salting the roads. We need to know that we have that available because we know how many people are actually here. Um, it's important to note that Oftentimes, in one immigration or um, one immigrant-based household, you very likely will see, or more often than not, will see multiple families living in a single-family household. So while you might think it's just the mother and children, there might be more people actually residing in that house. Um, again, I'll just touch on my family experience. I lived in a single-family home uh, with four bedrooms and two bathrooms, and we had 15 people living at my house when I was a kid. Um, and and so there were five of us in a room, and we figured it out, you know. And so that's very common. But if if you're dealing with a very um, fearful community, they're not going to want to claim all 15 people. But we want those people claimed, not because we care necessarily about their immigration status, but we need to know because I want to make sure my road is clear. I want to make sure that my school has the funds in order to provide an education for my children or for my neighbor's children, because I don't have any, you know, that kind of thing. That's why it's become so important. Um, and the, the question of citizenship, we, you know, I've actually met with the state demographer's office, and that has been something that we've kind of started talking about, is how is this going to affect Minnesota if people are going to be fearful of this question? Um, and one of the things that they had mentioned to me is that this year, or next year, will be the first time that the census will be offered electronically, and so people can fill out the census questions online. And so the, the, the person at the state office kind of said, isn't that great? Because now people won't have to worry about coming to, that someone's going to come to your home. You'll get to do it online and not worry about it. And I said, yeah, but that's assuming that the person has internet and has a computer at home. And that's also assuming that it, they speak and read English. But if you're talking about an immigrant family, Maybe the kids speak English, maybe they read English, but you can't assume that they do, and you can't assume that they have internet access. Oftentimes you'll see, especially in, in, other, in homes that are um, immigrant homes, they might not have internet or computer at home. They have it at school, so the kids may have access, or through their phones, but not necessarily a home-based computer. Um, and what they had mentioned to me is they said that 80%, uh, I believe, of the 2020 census will be done electronically. Then random 20% of people will be getting it by phone or by mail. And um, so that's great, but also which 20%? And which homes? You can't, de you can't designate, oh, well, all of these people have a Latino sounding last name, so therefore they should get it by mail. No, it's going to be at random. Um, and so you're, it, it, will it might impact how the census is done. But if the census is not completed electronically, if someone gets it electronically, then the home visits will start. And as I previously mentioned, there is a growing number of people fearful of ICE coming to their door. And if you see a person come to your door that you do not know, and they knock on your door, and you are fearful because you don't know who they are and what they want, the likelihood of you opening the door is very limited. And according to the state office, they will be making six home visits to try to get that information from you. And if after the sixth home visit they don't get it, they will try to get it from your neighbor. But if you think about it, if you're fearful of an ICE agent coming to your door and they're gonna make six visits, you're like, wow, these, these offices are really determined and they won't open the door. And so you still aren't gonna get that information when in fact it's an innocent 
application or something that's happening without the intent of, of causing the person harm. Um, and so it's something that we, we did in a round table. We just kind of discussed, you know, these are all the possible factors that could affect someone, especially when we want to encourage people to participate that might not necessarily come to our mind because we have no fear or, you know, maybe we do. You know, we are also in a time where people, there are people out there trying to cause harm for no reason. And are you going to open the door? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's like, if you don't know who it is, are you going to open the door? Exactly. So with that train of thought, I'm thinking of Yeah. Who I'm familiar with for clinical Yep. A high percentage of them don't ever use a computer. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not exactly sure. I think that's still being decided because the, the actual census has not yet been printed. The, the printing will start in June of this year. Um, and so once they start printing it, I think then they will determine how it's going to be distributed. But yes, essentially anyone who does not have easy access to the internet. I know like my most of my, my my mom and my dad, like they never use the computer. I'm always like, even though I live in Minnesota and they live in California, they call me. Like, how do I do this again? You know? And and so I can imagine what anyone that, that doesn't have that easy access is going is going to struggle. And so the numbers are not going to be Yeah. Oh yes. Yep. Very likely. Is saying there are someone or census worker, and and um, that's uh, that's actually a very good point, and I might actually bring that up to the demographer's office because I don't know that they they're still kind of in the works of it, but they met with us just last week for that reason because they were specifically asking immigration-based issues because I think they're asking a lot of different communities kind of to figure out what to do because it's going to be an electronic-based census this time for the first time ever. But that's a very good point that we didn't necessarily touch on, but I want to make sure that they. They know of. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Thank you for raising that issue because that is a big concern for for all of our community. We want to make sure that everybody's accounted for, but because they're kind of changing the way it's going to be done, in hopes that I think that they wanted it to be more quick and easier and whatever, but. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy as that. Miriam, I'm sorry, but uh, we're almost out of time. Oh, okay. I'm uh, sorry. No, it's okay. It's a, this is a fascinating talk. And uh, did you want to have a couple things that like you can wrap up? or Sure. We can, uh, you can stay a little bit later and people can ask you more questions. Definitely. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, okay. If they put the citizenship question on, do you have to answer? Yes. And that's actually one of the points I was just going to say um, that I found out because there, I kind of thought, well, I can just tell people, if I work with someone that's going to do the census, I can just tell them, well, don't answer that question and leave it blank. But I've been informed now that if you don't answer all of the questions, your census will not be counted towards the... And so it's a big concern. that That's why they come so many times to visit you and try to get that information or try to obtain it from your neighbors or people in the surrounding homes that might know you or know who's in that home because they want to have it completely filled out because that's the only way it can be tallied or added to the tally is if it's completely filled out, um, which is why it's a big problem because you might be pushing people away from answering it. Yeah, and it is supposed to remain confidential. However, we're still trying to determine if there is a way that information could be subpoenaed if required. Um, normally, that information is completely blocked or kept from the IRS, from ICE, and things like that. However, now that we do have a 
administration that really cares about deportation and removal, could that information then be subpoenaed if you're trying to find out a particular home or a particular household and the status or what they marked on there? And like I said about the citizenship question, if you ever declare to be a citizen, can that question be used to determine that you are now ineligible for immigration benefits? We don't know that particular, yes ma'am. Yeah. But my thought was, well, if that's the case, they would someone would have to be tracking your answer and then your voting. Yep. And it's, it's obvious that there's going to be some kind of language change. There. Yeah, exactly. By individuals. Yep. And also, it doesn't always take into account that you also have to count children in the census, you have to account for everyone in the household, not just adults. Right. And you might make a, make, make, make a mistake and say there's four voting, or there's four people that are citizens in the home, but only one of them is a voting, a voting age. So, you know, it, 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 yeah, it raises a lot of flags as to the purpose. Yes, ma'am. The electronic um, switchover to have votes with an electronic uh -huh. I think it's nationwide, but I only spoke with the state-based office because they're the ones handling it for Minnesota, and that's what they said, like how they were breaking it up. And I think each state is allowed to kind of do it as they saw best fit their state. So. so I see your last slide, Derek. Tell us what we can do. Yes. <laughs> And I think, yeah, and, and that was one of the big questions that I know when I spoke with Lisa about it was, you know, what, what can members do? And I think as, as we see that the Supreme Court just decided that they will hear the case in April, whether that question will go forward or not, um, I think, first of all, it's just staying educated and informed about what's happening with the census, in particular with immigration-based issues. If people are interested in immigration issues, that's always something we love to see that people are engaged and want to get involved. Um, but with the census in particular, you know, staying informed as to what's happening. Again, the census is supposed to be printed in June, so a decision by the Supreme Court has to come down before the census is printed, because my understanding is that once it's printed, even if the Supreme Court decides on it, but the census has already been printed, they can't ask it for this census. They might be able to ask it for the 2030 census, but not the 2020 census. Um, so staying informed. I know that the, the um, state offices are going to start reaching out, and I informed them that I was doing this presentation, so they might be reaching out to your chapter in particular about volunteering and getting involved and in helping people understand what the census is, um, and then also working with a lot of the immigrant or vulnerable communities to educate people and inform them that it's not scary, it's, we're not trying to track you, we just need the information because we need to provide funding. Um, and so that'll become more and more useful as the year progresses and, and going into 2020. Um, but I know that I, I think in uh, early next year is when they're gonna start hiring people to actually work as the home visit people and working with um, providing question and answer sessions and presentations and things like that, that especially for an organization such as yours, I think it would be very, very useful to have people present um, and, and getting involved and for people to see that we're here because we care. Um, and I think that that to me is probably the, the biggest thing for someone from an immigrant-based community that's going to be the, the key to getting people to do it. Our office is going to participate in that as well so that as we meet with clients, we inform them, don't forget, you need to do the census. For clients that um, want to do it or are given the opportunity to do it electronically, we'll be doing it at our office or they can if they want to or need access to a computer. We can do it with them or at least tell them how to fill it out um, and, and giving them access if they need it. For our clients at least, to try to give people information and I know that they're working working with some of the universities and things like that as the year progresses to figure out how to offer it to anyone that wants to complete it online. or Because um, the other big population that's never really accounted for is college students. Because if they don't live at home, 
oftentimes they just don't do it because they're like, well, I don't know which one I'm at. I, if I'm at St. Cloud or am I in Minneapolis? And then they just don't do it. Um, so that's a large community that also is often missed in the census. Um, that the, So they're really trying to work with universities as well to ensure that those populations are accounted for as well as part of the census, especially because Minnesota stands to lose representation in, in the federal um, Congress, you know, whereas other states don't have that, that risk. Um, yes, ma'am. Yep. And so if we're losing, if we're missing a percentage of our representation of our older population because of this way of, of filling out the form, yep. then that could be a huge hit for us disproportionate to other states. Yep, exactly. Oh, yes, definitely. And I know that that was something that they were going, that they were meeting, not with us, because they met with the immigration attorney separately, but that was something that they were going to start working on, too, with, with because of the aging population and who has access to the internet and where, um, that they were going to try to figure out alternative ways to getting that information, because they are for sure going electronic. Well, They've just... Yeah. Um, I mean, again, there's a number of reasons why this could disproportionately affect us. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I'll make sure I bring that up, too. We have organizations that will name you, like, like maybe Oxfam and stuff. You have senior organizations that can be, that will be pushing on something like this. I, I, would, I, would, I would assume that, that if, if folks like the Women's Health Area Agency on Aging and then the Women Voters and other organizations are doing that, we could get that information This is a little there, thank you. It's it's under the five dollar. This is the first we're hearing about this, so it's not as if there's been any kind of outreach to say, "Hey guys, this is happening." Because there's been so many other questions about the census. I think they're behind in their normal communications about standard things like digital versus paper. Yeah. So I think we're all going to be a little behind in this. I think we're so uh, <laughs> uh, grateful to Maria. Maria. Sorry. No, it's Could okay. You butcher your name. But so grateful to you for coming and to uh, informing us of, of all the things that we can now inform others about. Now that we are informed, we can now, you know, you know talk to other people and tell them about the, the dangers about the census and about immigrants and their experience here in Minnesota. So really, really appreciate your talk. And I hope you can stay a little bit later so that other people can ask more questions. Thank you again for all for Thank coming. You. Bye bye.